This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Surprise! I'm here with a bonus mini-series where I'm going to read to you the Henry James classic, The Turn of the Screw. And this is an addition each week to your normal Thursday episode, so you will be getting those as well as this special little mini-series. This was recently made into a movie set in modern times, and they renamed it The Turning. It stars that nice young man, Finn Wolfhard, who you know from It, as well as Stranger Things. And I realize this is starting to sound like this is sponsored by The Turning, and it is not. It is just me, you know, wanting to give you something extra. Well, with some of you not being able to leave your homes at the moment, and some of us being unemployed temporarily and thus trying not to spend extra money, I thought I'd bring the story to you. This also means if you do manage to get out and go see it, you can heartily remark that you prefer the original literature to the cinematic version. So, here we go. I don't know how many parts this is going to be. I did the math and I think it may be about four to six parts, um, depending. We're just going to get through it bit by bit until the end. It's longer than a short story, but not quite a full-length novel. It would be classified as a novella, I think. When it originally came out, it was released in 12 parts in Collier's Weekly Magazine. So we shall see how many parts it will take me. Please enjoy this scare you to sleep presentation of Henry James's 1898 classic, The Turn of the Screw. The story had held us round the fire, sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome, as on Christmas Eve in an old house, a strange tale should essentially be. I remember no comment uttered till somebody happened to say that it was the only case he had met in which such a visitation had fallen on a child. The case, I may mention, was that of an apparition in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind to a little boy in the room with his mother, and her waking up in the terror of it, waking her not to dissipate his dread and soothe him to sleep again, but to encounter also herself, before she had succeeded in doing so, the same sight that had shaken him. It was this observation that drew from Douglas, not immediately, but later in the evening, a reply that had the interesting consequence to which I call attention. Someone else told a story, not particularly effective, which I saw he was not following. This I took for a sign that he had himself something to produce, and that we should only have to wait. We waited, in fact, till two nights later, but... That same evening, before we scattered, he brought out what was on his mind. I quite agree, in regard to Griffin's ghost, or whatever it was, that its appearing first to the little boy at so tender an age adds a particular touch, but it's not the first occurrence of its charming kind that I know to have involved a child. If the child gives the effect another turn of the screw, What do you say to two children? We say, of course, somebody exclaimed, that they give two turns, also, that we want to hear about them. I can see Douglas there before the fire, to which he had got up to present his back, looking down at his interlocutor with his hands in his pockets. Nobody but me, till now, has ever heard... It's quite too terrible. This, naturally, was declared by several voices to give the thing the utmost price, and our friend, with quiet art, prepared his triumph by turning his eyes over the rest of us and going, It's beyond everything. 
Nothing at all that I know touches it. For sheer terror? I remember asking. He seemed to say it was not so simple as that. To be really at a loss how to qualify it, he passed his hand over his eyes, made a little wincing grimace. For dreadful dreadfulness! Oh, how delicious! cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked at me. But, as if instead of me, he saw what he spoke of. For general, uncanny, ugliness, and horror, and pain. Well then, I said, just sit right down and begin. He turned round to the fire, gave a kick to a log, watched it an instant. Then, as he faced us again, I can't begin. I shall have to send to town. There was a unanimous groan at this, and much reproach, after which, in his preoccupied way, he explained, The story's written. It's in a locked drawer. It has not been out for years. I could... I could write to my man and enclose the key. He could send down the packet as he finds it. It was to me, in particular, that he appeared to propound this. Appeared almost to appeal for aid, not to hesitate. He had broken a thickness of ice, the formation of many a winter. Had had his reasons for a long silence. The others resented postponement, but it was just his scruples that charmed me. I adjured him to write by the first post, and to agree with us for an early hearing. Then I asked him if the experience in question had been his own. To this his answer was prompt. Oh, thank God, no! And is the record yours? You took the thing down. Nothing but the impression. I took that here. He tapped his heart. I've never lost it. Then... Your manuscript is in old faded ink and in the most beautiful hand. He hung fire again. A woman's. She has been dead these twenty years. She sent me the pages in question before she died. They were all listening now, and of course there was somebody to be arch, or at any rate, to draw the inference. But if he put the inference by without a smile, it was also without irritation. She was a most charming person, but she was ten years older than I. She was my sister's governess, he quietly said. She was the most agreeable woman I've ever known in her position. She would have been worthy of any whatever. It was long ago, and this episode was long before. I was at Trinity, and I found her at home on my coming down the second summer. I was much there that year, it was a beautiful one, and we had, in her off hours, some strolls and talks in the garden, talks in which she struck me as awfully clever and nice. Oh yes, don't grin, I liked her extremely, and... I'm glad to this day to think that she liked me too. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. She had never told anyone. It wasn't simply that she said so, but that I knew she hadn't. I was sure. I could see. You'll easily judge why when you hear. Because the thing had been such a scare? He continued to fix me. You'll easily judge, he repeated. You will. I fixed him too. I see. She was in love. He laughed for the first time. You are acute. Yes, she was in love. That is, she had been. That came out. She couldn't tell her story without its coming out. I saw it, and she saw I saw it, but neither of us spoke of it. I remember the time and the place, the corner of the lawn, the shade of the great beaches, and 
The long, hot summer afternoon. It wasn't a scene for a shudder, but oh. He quitted the fire and dropped back into his chair. You'll receive the packet Thursday morning? I inquired. Probably not till the second post. Well, then after dinner. You'll all meet me here? He looked us round again. Isn't anybody going? It was almost the tone of hope. Everybody will stay. I will, and I will, cried the ladies whose departure had been fixed. Mrs. Griffin, however, expressed the need for a little more light. Who was it that she was in love with? The story will tell, I took upon myself to reply. Oh, I can't wait for the story. The story won't tell, said Douglas, not in any literal, vulgar way. More's the pity, then. That's the only way I ever understand. Won't you tell, Douglas? Somebody else inquired. He sprang to his feet again. Yes, tomorrow. Now I must go to bed. Good night. And quickly catching up a candlestick, he left us slightly bewildered. From our end of the great brown hall, we heard his step on the stair, whereupon Mrs. Griffin spoke. Well, if I don't know who she was in love with, I know who he was. She was ten years older, said her husband. Raison de plus at that age. But it's rather nice, his long reticence. Forty years, Griffin put in. With this outbreak at last. The outbreak, I returned, will make a tremendous occasion of Thursday night. And everyone so agreed with me that, in the light of it, we lost all attention for everything else. The last story, however incomplete and like the mere opening of a serial, had been told. We hand shook and candle stuck, as somebody said, and went to bed. I knew the next day that a letter containing the key had, by the first post, gone off to his London apartments. But, in spite of, or perhaps just on account of, the eventual diffusion of this knowledge, we quite let him alone till after dinner. Till such an hour of the evening, in fact, as might best accord with the kind of emotion on which our hopes were fixed. Then, he became as communicative as we could desire, and, indeed, gave us his best reasoning for being so. We had it from him again, before the fire in the hall, as we had had our mild wonders of the previous night. It appeared that the narrative he had promised to read us really required for a proper intelligence a few words of prologue. Let me say here distinctly, to have done with it, that this narrative, from an exact transcript of my own made much later, is what I shall presently give. Poor Douglas, before his death when it was in sight, committed to me the manuscript that reached him on the third of these days and that, on the same spot, with immense effect, he began to read to our hushed little circle on the night of the fourth. The departing ladies who had said that they would stay didn't, of course, thank heaven, stay. They departed, in consequence of arrangements made in a rage of curiosity as they professed, produced by the touches with which he had already worked us up. But that only made his little final auditory more compact and select. Kept it round the hearth, subject to a common thrill. The first of these touches conveyed that the written statement took up the tale at a point after it had, in a manner, begun. The fact to be in possession of was, therefore, that his old friend, the youngest of several daughters of a poor country parson, had... At the age of twenty, on taking service for the first time in the schoolroom, come up to London in trepidation to answer in person an advertisement that had already placed her in brief correspondence with the advertiser. This person proved, on her presenting herself for judgment at a house in Harley Street, that impressed her as 
vast and imposing. This prospective patron proved a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of his life, such a figure as had never risen, save in a dream or an old novel, before a fluttered, anxious girl out of a Hampshire vicarage. One could easily fix his type. It never, happily, dies out. He was handsome and bold and pleasant, offhand and gay and kind. He struck her inevitably as gallant and splendid. But what took her most of all and gave her the courage she afterwards showed was that he put the whole thing to her as a kind of favor, an obligation he should gratefully incur. She conceived him as rich, but as fearfully extravagant, saw him all in a glow of high fashion, of good looks, of expensive habits, of charming ways with women. He had, for his own town residence, a big house filled with the spoils of travel and the trophies of the chase. But it was to his country home, an old family place in Essex, that he wished her immediately to proceed. He had been left, by the death of their parents in India, guardian to a small nephew and a small niece, children of a younger, a military brother whom he had lost two years before. These children were, by the strangest of chances for a man in his position, a lone man without the right sort of experience or a grain of patience, very heavily on his hands. It had all been a great worry, and, on his own part, doubtless a series of blunders, but he immensely pitied the poor chicks and had done all he could, had in particular sent them down to his other house, the proper place for them being, of course, the country, and kept them there for the first, with the best people he could find to look after them, parting even with his own servants to wait on them and going down himself whenever he might to see how they were doing. The awkward thing was that they had practically no other relations and that his own affairs took up all his time. He had put them in possession of Bly, which was healthy and secure, and had placed at the head of their little establishment, but below stairs only, an excellent woman, Mrs. Gross, whom he was sure his visitor would like and who had formerly been maid to his mother. She was now housekeeper and was also acting for time as superintendent to the little girl, of whom, without children of her own, she was, by good luck, extremely fond. There were plenty of people to help, but, of course, the young lady who should go down as governess would be in supreme authority. She would also have, in holidays, to look after the small boy, who had been for a term at school. Young as he was to be sent, but what else could be done, and who, as the holidays were about to begin, would be back from one day to the other. There had been, for the two children, at first a young lady whom they had the misfortune to lose. She had done for them quite beautifully. She was a most respectable person, till her death, the great awkwardness of which had precisely left no alternative but the school for little miles. Mrs. Gross, since then, in the way of manners and things, had done as she could for Flora, and there were further a cook, a housemaid, a dairywoman, an old pony, an old groom, and an old gardener, all likewise thoroughly respectable. So far had Douglas presented his picture when someone put a question. And what did the former governess die of? <laughs> of so much respectability? Our friend's answer was prompt. That will come out, I don't anticipate. Excuse me, I thought that was just what you were doing. In her successor's place, I suggested. I should have wished to learn if the office brought with it necessary danger to life. Douglas completed my thought. She did wish to learn, and she did learn. You shall hear tomorrow what she learned. Meanwhile, of course, the prospect struck her as slightly grim. She was young, untried, nervous. It was a vision of serious duties and little company, of really great loneliness. She hesitated, took a couple of days to consult and consider, but the salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, 
And on a second interview, she faced the music. She engaged. And Douglas, with this, made a pause that, for the benefit of the company, moved me to throw in the moral of which was, of course, the seduction exercised by the splendid young man. She succumbed to it. He got up, and, as he had done the night before, went to the fire, gave a stir to a log with his foot, then stood a moment with his back to us. She saw him only twice. Yes, but that's just the beauty of her passion. A little to my surprise on this, Douglas turned round to me. It was the beauty of it. There were others, he went on, who hadn't succumbed. He told her frankly all his difficulty, that for several applicants the conditions had been prohibitive. They were somehow simply afraid. It sounded dull, it sounded strange, and all the more so because of his main condition. Which was that she should never trouble him, but never, never, neither appeal nor complain nor write about anything, only meet all questions herself, receive all monies from his solicitor, take the whole thing over and let him alone. She promised to do this, and she mentioned to me that when, for a moment, disburdened, delighted, he held her hand, thanking her for the sacrifice, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? One of the ladies asked. She never saw him again. Oh, said the lady, which, as our friend immediately left us again, was the only other word of importance contributed to the subject till the next night. By the corner of the hearth, in the best chair, he opened the faded red cover of a thin, old-fashioned, gilt-edged album. The whole thing took, indeed, more nights than one, but on the first occasion the same lady put another question. What is your title? I haven't one. Oh, I have, I said. But Douglas, without heeding me, had begun to read, with a fine clearness that was like a rendering to the ear of the beauty of his author's hand. Chapter One I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had, at all events, a couple of very bad days, found myself doubtful again, felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found... Toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly in waiting for me. Driving at that hour, on a lovely day, through a country to which the summer sweetness seemed to offer me friendly welcome, my fortitude mounted afresh, and, as we turned into the avenue, encountered a reprieve that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected, or had dreaded, something so melancholy— that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a most pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains and pair of maids looking out. I remember the lawn and the bright flowers and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel and the clustered treetops over which the rooks circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor still more of a gentleman suggested that what I was to enjoy might be something beyond his promise. 
I had no drop again till the next day, for I was carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl, who accompanied Mrs. Gross, appeared to me on the spot a creature so charming as to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and I afterwards wondered that my employer had not told me more of her. I slept little that night. I was too much excited, and this astonished me too, I recollect, remained with me, adding to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large, impressive room, one of the best in the house, the great state bed, as I almost felt it, the full-figured draperies, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot, all struck me, like the extraordinary charm of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well, from the first moment, that I should get on with Mrs. Gross in a relation over which, on my way, in the coach, I feared I had rather brooded. The only thing, indeed, that, in this early outlook, might have made me shrink again, was the clear circumstance of her being so glad to see me. I perceived within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered, even then a little, why she should wish not to show it, and that, with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl, the vision whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that, before morning, made me several times rise and wander about my room to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn, to look at such portions of the rest of the house as I could catch and listen while in the fading dusk the first birds began to twitter, for the possible recurrence of a sound or two, less natural, and not without, but within, that I had fancied I'd heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognized, faint and far, the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage before my door of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough to be thrown off, and... It is only in the light, or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. To watch, teach, form, little Flora would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that after this first occasion, I should have her as a matter of course at night, her small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained, just this last time, with Mrs. Gross, only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity, in spite of this timidity, which the child herself, in the oddest way in the world, had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with a deep, sweet serenity, indeed, of one of Raphael's holy infants, to be discussed, to be imputed to her and to determine us. I felt quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder as I sat at supper with four tall candles and with my pupil in a high chair and a bib brightly facing me between them over bread and milk. There were naturally things that, in Flora's presence, could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout allusions. And the little boy, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable, if you think well of this one. And she stood there with a plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other with placid, heavenly eyes that contained nothing to check us. Yes, if I do, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. Well, that, I think, is what I came for, to be carried away. I'm afraid, however. 
I remember feeling the impulse to add, I'm rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street? In Harley Street. (laughs) Well, miss, you're not the first and you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretension, I could laugh, to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow? Not tomorrow. Friday, miss. He arrives as you did, by the coach, under care of the guard, and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith expressed that the proper as well as the pleasant and friendly thing would be, therefore, that on the arrival of the public conveyance I should be in waiting for him with his little sister, an idea in which Mrs. Gross concurred so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should on every question be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could be fairly called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. It was probably, at the most, only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale. As I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in of my new circumstances, they had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared, and in the presence of which I found myself freshly a little scared, as well as a little proud. Lessons in the agitation certainly suffered some delay. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step, and room by room, and secret by secret, with droll, delightful, childish talk about it, and with the result, in half an hour, of our becoming immense friends. Young as she was, I was struck, throughout our little tour, with her confidence and courage with the way in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old machicolated square tower that made me dizzy. Her morning music, her disposition to tell me so many more things than she asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to my older and more informed eyes, it would now appear sufficiently contracted. But as my little conductress with her hair of gold and her frock of blue danced before me round corners and pattered down passages, I had the view of a castle of romance, inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, for diversion of the young idea, take all color out of storybooks and fairy tales. Wasn't it just a storybook over which I had fallen a doze and a dream? No. It was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half replaced and half utilized, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm. Chapter 2 This came home to me when, two days later, I drove over with Flora to meet, as Mrs. Gross said, the little gentleman, and all the more for an incident that, presenting itself the second evening, had deeply disconcerted me. The first day had been, on the whole, as I have expressed, reassuring, but I was to see it wind up in keen apprehension. The post bag that evening, it came late, contained a letter for me, which, however in the hand of my employer, I found to be composed but of a few words enclosing another, addressed to himself, with a seal still unbroken. This, I recognize, is from the headmaster, and the headmaster's an awful bore. Read him, please. Deal with him. But mind you don't report. Not a word. I'm off. I broke the seal with a great effort, so great a one that I was a long time coming to it. 
took the unopened missive at last up to my room and only attacked it just before going to bed. I had better have let it wait till morning, for it gave me a second sleepless night. With no counsel to take, the next day I was full of distress, and it finally got so the better of me that I determined to open myself at least to Mrs. Gross. What does it mean? The child's dismissed his school. She gave me a look that I remarked at the moment, then visibly, with a quick blankness, seemed to try to take it back. But aren't they all? Sent home, yes, but only for the holidays. Miles may never go back at all. Consciously, under my attention, she reddened. They won't take him? They absolutely decline. At this, she raised her eyes, which she had turned from me. I saw them fill with good tears. What has he done? I hesitated, then I judged best simply to hand her my letter, which, however, had the effect of making her, without taking it, simply put her hands behind her. She shook her head sadly. Such things are not for me, miss. My counselor couldn't read. I winced at my mistake, which I attenuated as I could, and opened the letter again to repeat it to her, then, faltering in the act and folding it up once more, I put it back in my pocket. Is he really bad? The tears were still in her eyes. Do the gentlemen say so? They go into no particulars. They simply express their regret that it should be impossible to keep him. That can only have one meaning. Mrs. Gross listened with dumb emotion. She forbore to ask me what this meaning might be. So that, presently, to put the thing with some coherence and with the mere aid of her presence to my own mind, I went on. That he's an injury to the others. At this, with one of the quick turns of simple folk, she suddenly flamed up. Master Miles, him, an injury? There was such a flood of good faith in it that, though I had not yet seen the child... My very fears made me jump to the absurdity of the idea. I found myself, to meet my friend the better, offering it on the spot, sarcastically, to his poor little innocent mates. (laughs) It's too dreadful, cried Mrs. Gross, to say such cruel things when, why, he's scarce ten years old. Yes, yes, it, it would be incredible. She was evidently grateful for such a profession. See him, miss, first, then believe it. I felt forthwith a new impatience to see him. It was the beginning of a curiosity that, for all the next hours, was to deepen almost to pain. Mrs. Gross was aware, I could judge, of what she had produced in me, and she followed it up with assurance. You might as well believe it of the little lady, bless her, she added the next moment. Look at her! I turned and saw that Flora, whom ten minutes before I had established in the schoolroom with a sheet of white paper, a pencil, and a copy of nice round O's, now presented herself to view at the open door. She expressed in her little way an extraordinary detachment from disagreeable duties, looking to me, however with a great childish light that seemed to offer it as a mere result of the affection she had conceived for my person, which had rendered necessary that she should follow me. I needed nothing more than this to feel the full force of Mrs. Gross's comparison, and catching my pupil in my arms, covered her with kisses in which there was a sob of atonement. Nonetheless, the rest of the day, I watched for further occasion to approach my colleague, especially as, toward evening, I began to fancy she rather sought to avoid me. I overtook her, I remember, on the staircase. We went down together, and at the bottom I detained her, holding her there with a hand on her arm. I take what you said to me at noon as a declaration that you've never known him to be bad. She threw back her head. She had clearly, by this time, and very honestly, adopted an attitude. 
Oh, never known him. I don't pretend that. I was upset again. Then you have known him. Yes, indeed, miss. Thank God. On reflection, I accepted this. You mean that a boy who never is... is no boy for me? I held her tighter. You like them with the spirit to be naughty. Then, keeping pace with her answer, So do I, I eagerly brought out. But not to the degree to contaminate. To contaminate. My big word left her at a loss. I explained, To corrupt. She stared, taking my meaning in, but it produced in her an odd laugh. (laughs) Are you afraid he'll corrupt you? She put the question with such a fine, bold humor that, with a laugh, a little silly, doubtless, to match her own, I gave way for the time to the apprehension of ridicule. But, the next day, as the hour for my drive approached, I cropped up in another place. What was the lady who was here before? The last governess? She was all so young and pretty and... Almost as young and almost as pretty, miss, even as you. Ah, then I hope her youth and her beauty helped her. I recollect throwing off. He seems to like us, young and pretty. Oh, he did, Mrs. Gross assented. It was the way he liked everyone. She had no sooner spoken indeed than she caught herself. I mean, that's his way, the master's. I was struck. But of whom did you speak first? She looked blank, but she colored. Why, of him? Of the master? Of who else? There was so obviously no one else that the next moment I had lost my impression of her having accidentally said more than she meant, and I merely asked what I wanted to know. Did she see anything in the boy? That wasn't right. She never told me. I had a scruple, but I overcame it. Was she careful? Particular? Mrs. Gross appeared to try to be conscientious. Uh, About some things, yes. But not about all. Again, she considered. Well, miss, she's gone. I won't tell tales. I quite understand your feeling, I hastened to reply. But I thought it, after an instant, not opposed to this concession to pursue. Did she die here? No, she went off. I don't know what there was in this brevity of Mrs. Gross's that struck me as ambiguous. Went off to die? Mrs. Gross looked straight out of the window, but I felt that, hypothetically, I had a right to know what young persons engaged for Bly were expected to do. She was taken ill, you mean, and went home. She was not taken ill, so far as appeared in this house. She left it at the end of the year to go home, as she said, for a short holiday to which the time she had put in had certainly given her a right, we had then a young woman, a nursemaid, who stayed on, and who was a good girl and clever, and she took the children altogether for the interval. But our young lady never came back, and at the very moment I was expecting her, I heard from the master that she was dead. I turned this over. But of what... He never told me. But please, miss, said Mrs. Gross, I must get to my work. Thanks for listening. This has been the first part of the Turn of the Screw miniseries here on the channel. This story starts to get crazy. I know the language can be a little hard to understand at points. Um, Henry James loved his run-on sentences. Seriously, 
there are just commas everywhere and not enough and too many and I feel like the editor was just like oh god I don't know and kind of threw commas in random places it's it's insane to read anyway <laughs> but you can see near the end he got a little less flowery and a little more just into the story I feel like he was like okay let, let's go let's be less poetic and more like spooky next week we will meet this bad little boy who has been kicked out of his boarding school I can't wait see you then and sweet dreams.